Welcome everyone. Uh, we have one last topic to discuss from the Grossberg book um, that I think is pretty interesting actually and a lot of fun. <laughs> Too bad it um, uh, had to be all, all the way at the end like this. Um, but uh, it kind of extends on what we were talking about before, the idea of a basis set and sort of composing a representation out of simpler things. Uh, in this case, uh, talking about, about space. So, so we talked about this idea that, that when we represent something a lot of the time, but not necessarily all the time, we are, we are constructing some sort of basis out of simple steps, which may or may not be orthogonal. And in fact, in, in the model that we're about to talk about, they aren't really, they're not orthogonal. Um, pieces that you can combine often with linear co combinations um, that can, can cover the space that you're interested in. And in, in function space, this becomes um, uh, a much more complicated thing because we are talking about somehow um, an infinite basis set that, that is still some, uh, practically useful. Of course, with the Shannon Nyquist frequency, we always lop off and say we're not interested in um, periodicities above a certain frequency. So, so yeah, there's uh, um, like what the, the, this panel in the middle is the kind of temp temporal idea and the spatial versions on, on, on spheres that, that will crop up in quantum mechanics. So here we're gonna talk about something spatial, but the, when you look at some of this periodic stuff, there's a, there's a strong temptation to like think in temporal terms, especially I, I like to always think in terms of time evolution, but you have to be careful when you're looking at, at, at uh, the brain processing of space because you're often looking at a spatial pattern. So <laughs> I was actually talking about this uh, with someone today and I just thought, you know, it's one of those philosophical topics that seems to be a complete waste of time. Let's just blow our minds and talk about what space is. But, but there are actually useful things you can say if you actually, you know, uh, pause a little bit to ask, well, what does it mean? Um, uh, for, um, so there's this Euclidean space that we're so familiar with in some sense that we often don't like step back and ask, well, what exactly is Euclidean space? Um, and then on the other hand, we went through um, uh, a lot of, we spent a lot of time last year talking about phase space, which uh, allows it, you to kind of take the more general view of space as possibility space. And whether that possibility is uh, a set of locations as is the case in Euclidean space or location plus velocity or abstract quantity and its derivative or a whole set of abstract quantities, that's kind of up to you. And each point uh, is a possibility so I have like some tentative definition slash ideas that uh, can kind of get one thinking. Uh, a space is where possibilities reside. Um, and so physical space is the set of locations where a dimensionless part particle can possibly or conceivably be. And uh, any space in which a set of dynamical systems lives consists of points that a traje tra trajectory can pass through. I thought this was useful because there's, there's this sort of new process centric way of thinking. And one consequence of that is that points are kind of demoted in favor of paths. So you kind of have to redefine what a point is in terms of, of crossings. Uh, so this is another way of thinking about what points are. Uh, in a way it kind of harked back to Aristotle. Um, and representations of space help us distinguish um, the potential of virtual from the actual. Uh, this is like a whole theme that that again seems abstract, but when we uh, look at you know families of trajectories, we're saying, well, this could happen, but this is the one that actually happened, or this is the trajectory that I actually simulated or implemented. So we kind of it, it, in one kind of image or frame metaphor, we combine the possible and the um, the potential and the actual. So a map, uh, the lowly map, does this right when you like X marks the spot. Uh, uh, at, well, there will, be, there will be a time when you know there's something actual there. It could be you in the case of you are here, uh, or um, so that's the actual part. When they, all the rest of it is the possible places where you could be. Uh, so yeah, that's sort of what we can say without getting too philosophical. So the hippocampus has long been associated with space. Most of you know this. Uh, the Nobel Prize um, in 2014 was awarded to John O'Keefe, Mybrit, and uh, Edward Moser for the discoveries of cells that constitute a positioning system in the brain. This was, I think, a very unfortunate choice of words because there was a whole uh, vast number of, of opinion pieces that compared the grid and place cell system to a global positioning system. It was the GPS system of the brain. And this is very, very uh, 
like like i'm fine with metaphors but like the the, the gps thing first of all people don't know how it works so uh, meaning the first people who use it and it will it, the way it works is so different from anything that an animal could possibly use that it really just mystifies more than anything else uh, it also kind of makes you kind of not ask the right questions about what a place cell does so place cell fires like imagine if you had a bell that rings every time you're at a particular place what use is it you have to, uh, it just tells you here you are so you have to kind of think more about what actually is done with the place cell so here's a nice schematic diagram of the firing response of a of a of a of several place cells so the color coding shows like the pink is the first cell right in front of the, of the rat's face so on multiple passes through this maze um, that that cell will fire uh, and uh, typically you need to kind of run through the these trajectories multiple times to actually see the pattern so here the the entire track is tiled with the firing of diff different uh, neurons and when you kind of move to a different place these place cells remap in ways that are uh, they're not consistent, meaning that two place cells might that are representing nearby positions in in one maze or one or even open field might be far apart, representing far apart places in um, uh, a different situation. And how how the animal gets from one place to the other actually will determine whether the remapping is sudden or gradual. Which is a super interesting topic we won't have time to get into, um, and. Uh, um, the Mosers, so, so the John O'Keefe discovered um, place cells and the Moser discovered grid cells. And I think a lot of people have seen this diagram. And even when I saw it at first, I didn't quite know what I was looking at, uh, but, so, but we'll talk about that. Um, so yeah, so, so yeah, okay. And just today, actually, oh yes, a couple of days ago, um, Stephen Marin, who studies the limbic system, he posted this um, thing, a nice little historical note that uh, Olga Vinogradova was the first neurophysiologist to infer a role for the hippocampus in memory and information storage. I thought that was pretty cool. And I, I, I knew her name because one of our colleagues, um, Stefan, his thesis model was uh, cited Vinogradova and implemented a version of, of the kind of idea that she was talking about from one of her um, papers, which was, I remember looking at it and it was just so old school. It just shows these, these sort of um, just spike clusters basically, but they were really clear. The qualitative pattern was super clear that familiarity kind of meant that things were, it was basically an error signal was, was, was being computed. Um, so I you know, dug into that. So pretty early on, she had this hypo hypothesis of uh, that the hippocampus is at the core of the orienting reflex and works as a comparator determining whether information should be stored in memory or ignored. What's really cool about this, which is from the 60s, is that this is pretty much what people have, uh, say about, about hippocampus as, a, as like now as like a fresh new theory. And interestingly, whenever, so for those of you who are like hippocampus insiders might be aware that before John O'Keefe, um, there was this idea that the hippocampus is involved in behavioral inhibition. It was actually a long tradition up to the 70s of, of saying that this, and, and, and there's still data on this all throughout this whole time, but it kind of got, Put aside because of how cool place cells were and this cognitive map idea and somehow behavioral inhibition seemed like some dumb behaviorist idea um, but i think that these two are not mutually exclusive ideas and i think this 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 you know thing i've put in bold kind of tells you why uh, behavioral inhibition and orienting are two sides of the same coin you have to kind of stop what you're doing in order to reorient and it's typically you're reor reor reorienting because some sort of error has happened. So, and in space, you the way that in which you reorient will be based on representations of where you are and where you may need to be. So this always struck me as obvious, uh, but I, I never saw anyone say it clearly, but I'm pretty sure that uh, I, I haven't, dug, dug, haven't dug into her work, but I'm pretty sure that that she would appreciate that the fact that these, these two kind of uh, sides in this hippocampus story uh, are not that far off actually. Especially when you think about the limbic part of the hippocampus, the, the more ventral in, in um, primates, which is involved in the limbic system quite closely. Johan, yes. why was the word reflex used here? Orienting uh, reflex? Well, I haven't looked into the details, but this is like the old school way of talking about these things involved like so when you perform some particular you know, stimulus change, there's a sort of automatic response that happens. It's probably something like that. 
Uh, and there, there, were, there were these very large lesion studies that, that were being done in the 50s and 60s that kind of pointed to interrupting these kinds of reflexes. It's probably more complicated than a reflex. I wouldn't necessarily commit to the idea that it's a reflex, but the idea of some sort of error-based reorienting, whether it's reflexive or not, that's sort of a more semantic issue. But some of them may look very much like reflexes if they're very low level and don't involve a whole lot of learning. But once learning is involved, it wouldn't be a reflex anymore. I think the sub answer, Ram, is behaviorism. Oh, I'm sorry? <laughs> Say it behaviorism. Okay. There, everyone at that time, right, there was a big push towards understanding everything a brain could do through reflexes, building up from, you know, the, the reflex that you'd get through, you know, the knee to the spinal cord and back to the knee to kick out your leg. They wanted to build everything up from there. Right. And the orienting reflex, a salient stimulus causing attention to be focus another location was this kind of really tangible, graspable mechanic function that was going to be a building block for higher thinking. And so I think it was a lot of it was like, if we can have this, then you'll have to give us more. And it was a, a real sort of starting point for people to start right. hacking away at the central processes. Anyway, yeah. I think no, that's that, kind of like that, what Johan said. Yeah. Yeah, that, that's it how I interpreted it. I just wanted to make sure that it's, if it's always sensation and action going together as a Pair, which is a reflex. If yeah, so, about... so the terminology has changed. Like it's, it's kind of interesting because in the when I entered grad school, it was already sort of declining, but but you could still kind of come across behaviorist papers and, and behaviorist terminology. But by the 2010s, it, it, people could easily forget that all the way up until the 90s, it was hard to talk about the mind or internal states uh, in vast sections of psychology and um, and neuroscience. And, and uh, that was, you know, talked about it the cognitive revolution kind of helped and then now it's like the next thing that needs to be defeated apparently yeah, that but i was getting it okay thanks <laughs> so um so here's the paper I, uh, this is again the fun thing about pre presenting stuff like this is you can go back to the original papers and and see what they look like it's a tiny little paper with just one figure uh that you can kind of tell what's happening just from one quick glance they had a pretty small box and they were pushing the rat along uh, and, and depending on where that was facing different cells were fired. That's it. That was the first. And, and I remember, I, uh, I think John O'Keefe was like, was doing an interview and talked about how they were just listening to these spikes on us coming out of a speaker. So, so I think initially there was an element of serendipity. They didn't really know what they were looking for, but they found, oh, there's a coincidence between what I hear and where the, the, the rat happens to be. Supposed, and there was no stats or anything. It was, it was only when the late 70s, early 80s that stats started really become a major factor <clears throat> in a lot of this. So, so that's in CA1 <clears throat> of the hippocampus. <clears throat> that's the main output center, output region of the hippocampus. That's where, and I believe you can find place cells elsewhere also, but, but because CA1 is the output center, people often talk about place cells there. Meaning you can find them in CA3 also and presumably elsewhere in the brain as well. Um, and uh, much later in 2005, this paper uh, from the Moser's lab came out um, and uh, which found that if you look at the entorhinal cortex, which is, what is, which is the only cortical source of input to the hippocampus, which I'll get to that in a moment. Um, over there, if you record, you see this uh, intriguing pattern, which actually requires a bit of data analysis to actually catch. So when the animal is wandering around in a, in a large um, uh, enclosure, uh, freely moving, and they gradually explore it, um, there are the, but basically there are cells that fire according to a hexa hexagonal pattern. So when it reaches this particular periodicity, um, uh, it will fire again. And uh, they kind of tile in phase, in spatial phase. So that means that if there's a grid of a particular spacing, like a few centimeters, 10 centimeters or 20 centimeters, you'll find another grid cell that's the same spacing, but displaced in, in spatial phase. And that's what this figure on top is showing. The way that you have to actually calculate this is using a spatial autocorrelogram. And then you can compare cells um, in terms of their phase using um, spatial cross correlogram. But basically the spatial analog of the temporal thing, but you have to do it in two dimensions. So a little bit more, I'm sure there are just packages for this now anyway. Um, um, and uh, there are some important facts about this, that the grid cells are aligned to environmental landmarks. They take a while to form also. So if you put an animal in a new 
uh, environment, they won't initially see particularly strong grid patterns and, and they explore the, the space wandering uh, kind of like almost randomly. And then you see the grid cell pattern form and then stabilize. And then we'll get to this later there. Once they're stabilized, you can turn off the lights and the grid cell pattern is still there. They, they, they do this actually in this paper, quite nice actually, that they thought to do that. Because um, Himanshu, I'm going to be talking about Himanshu Matra's model, and he um, was frequently asked about uh, about this as if the grid cell system were a visual uh, um, system or something that operates purely on visual input, but it doesn't. It, but it isn't, as we'll see. Uh, in fact, for some reason, he went and presented his model in, in VSS, a Vision Science Conference, <laughs> which must have confused a lot of people. <laughs> it's almost like when you hear about hexagons, you just assume vision on some level. <laughs> um, so um, when I looked at the Scholopedia page on this, um, on grid cells, the Moses wrote it actually, and it, they have a nice little, it's a short historical um, paragraph, which very helpfully points out some of the things that happened between O'Keefe and, um, and their paper. So in the eighties, um, there was the discovery of head direction cells, which pretty self-explanatory. They keep tra track of which way the animal is pointing with respect again to some landmark that, that's been stabilized. And they have, as you can see, fairly narrow uh, angular uh, selectivity. So um, this is uh, going to be part of the ingredients for this, this uh, model of, of how good cells seem to uh, form. But, they were, but yeah, they, they, so there was a kind of gradual collection of piece, bits and pieces um, that, that built up uh, to the discovery of uh, place cells. So this is in the post subiculum. So there's all these pieces in different parts of the hippocampal structure. Um, here, right, the animal's head pointed in a particular direction relative to the laboratory frame. So the frame is anchored to you know, uh, something outside. Um, so the story, which most people, as soon as they heard about good cells, <coughs> <coughs> Everyone immediately thought, ah, this must be how place cells are formed. And the theoretical reason is fairly straightforward. It's the same logic from what we saw last week with the striatal beak frequency model or the spectral timing model that you just sum up uh, or find them, you know, a smart way of summing up these, these signals. And then you'll get a representation of location that's unique up to some scale in the case of periodic uh, functions. Um, so periodic um, basis sets work like clocks. So the hour hand and the minute hand are two periodic signals that uh, together combine uh, to specify a time point. I'm wondering if there were any real world examples of people using periodic spatial scales. And I couldn't really think of anything, but they, you could imagine like the New York, like some sort of vast expansion of the city of New York that goes from, you know, first street to a hundred and whatever street and then starts again from one. That, that would be a periodic, a spatial representation or like first avenue to eighth avenue and then first avenue again. Um, so this, uh, so Pili and Grossberg uh, developed the model of Matre and Grossberg, but, and so this is the kind of boxology, the pieces of the puzzle that uh, most people uh, would tend to put together um, to, to, to model the formation of good cells. But Steve's work with kind of putting like different people's PhD theses were putting together different nodes in this larger network. So making angular head velocity turn into head direction cells. Um, then sort of, I think earlier there was a map of how grid cells could produce place cells so up on top. Uh, and Himanshu's model was basically how you go from head direction cells and striped cells to grid cells, this middle part here. So before we get into that, just take a brief look at the anatomy, partly because it's so hard to visualize. I always find myself completely lost when I'm thinking about uh, the hippocampus, particularly in primates, but it's, it's confusing enough even in rodents. But here's the, um, you know, at the top is Gray's anatomy and, and then you, it's sitting inside the temporal lobe. So, so here's an interesting way, here's a way of kind of thinking about it. Like imagine that your hand held this way is a hemisphere and the thumb is a sort of tiny temporal lobe. The hippocampus sits on the inside of the thumb here and on the lower kind of side of it. And when people often just present this sort of canonical circuit, which is a slice through the hippocampus, but it's not quite uh, either a coronal or a sagittal section because of the way the hippocampus is shaped. 
So it's a transverse section, but because the main axis of the hippocampus is a bit curly, you can't really associate it with dorsal ventral or anterior posterior curls around. Um, so this is so it's almost like this. This is a Swiss roll, and this is what it, the Swiss roll looks like if you slice through it. Um, and uh, this is a, a slightly more helpful figure. I keep going to Google image image search to find good diagrams of the hippocampus, but there aren't that many. Fairly fairly rare. Um, so yeah, this uh, this has the medial and lateral uh, the, the compass points to help. So this is sort of looking down on the on the hippocampus from above. Um, and this is a coronal section, meaning looking from, from straight on. And so the medial is on this side. So it's right by the hippocamp, the amygdala is on one side, very close by. So we have all these the most important um, parts of it, the dentate gyrus, the CA subfields, um, prosubiculum, subiculum, and the internal cortex is a very simple, uh, not very laminated um, co cortex. If you remember Helen's structural model, it's one of the most, um, limbic cortices, very, very weakly laminated. Um, so it's a fairly ancient structure. In fact, one story is that the cortex kind of begins its evolution as an extension of the hippocampus. So the temporal evolution kind of follows this sort of spiral outwards. Um, there's, there's a fair amount of data on that. So yeah, that's what that is. Um, and the nomenclature, uh, I guess you can see why the hippocampus looks like a uh, a seahorse, uh, and uh, but the CA subfields are named after the god Ammon, <laughs> and it's called Cornu Ammonis because the, the the god Ammon, which is a fusion, of, so it's Zeus Ammon, a fusion of the Roman and the Greek god, was often shown wearing a curly ram's horn. So these anatomists decided that's what they wanted to call uh, this part of the hippocampus. Um, so anyway, back to the, the model. This is uh, Himanshu's grids map model, Himanshu Mathe. Uh, it's grid regularity from integrated distance through self-organizing map. Steve loves uh, acronyms. And here's a very uh, clever one, I suppose. Um, so, so yeah, this is the same set of things. I'm not going to walk through the, the boxology because we're actually going to just focus on um, the, the, the sort of core mechanism which is turning stripe cells into grid cells, and why do you need stripe cells, and what are stripe cells? Um, so yeah, this is the kind of schematic of what we were doing. It has a, a representation of the animal. It has linear velocity signals and angular velocity signals, and those are combined in some way to produce these things called stripe cells. And then there's learning that happens that will produce the grid cells. So as a general, Kind of, uh, we can actually walk through the steps in, involved in the logic uh, of this model quite easily. Um, so this is sort of trivial, but but kind of nice to work work through. Integrating al angular acceleration gives you angular velocity. Integrating angular velocity gives you angular displacement, head direction. The same with linear uh, movement. So linear acceleration, if you integrate that, you get linear velocity, and you integrate that, and you get linear displacement. Why all this? <laughs> like we often think that that space or location is primary, but uh, but that's kind of in a kind of conceptual sense, or when you're teaching children about it or something. But from the perspective of estimation, the forces are actually much more directly relevant to an animal, and from forces or accelerations, speeds and then positions can be inferred, and that's how accelerometers work. So this accelerometer physics. Uh, is kind of at that uh, at the core of of this system, um, but there's an interesting constraint for the brain. Neural representations are bounded, so whereas with an angular acceleration um, integrator, because your angles are bound between zero and three sixty degrees, zero and two pi, um, you don't have to worry about this. But for how far have I traveled? You cannot just keep track of an arbitrarily large distance. Uh, at least not with an, an analog representation. For humans, we can create symbolic representations, and even there, we need a piece of paper or something, or a device in order to to make use of that. And that will also have some physical limitations. So there's a constraint that we have to work with, uh, which is that uh, I can't, I cannot keep track of how far I've traveled in a particular direction indefinitely. So some sort of reset is needed. We'll continue to integrate. 
but we'll 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 integrate up to a point and then say okay starting again from from the beginning and uh, this logic is um, how you kind of get to spatially periodic representations of linear displacement and these things are called in this paper stripe cells uh, at the time when this model was proposed, uh, there was only something similar in another model called band cells, but those were kind of stipulated <clears throat> kind of in a top-down way, just as something that exists as a spatial sinusoid. The reasoning involving acceleration um, integration wasn't really offered, but uh, now there is experimental evidence that something like band or stripe cells uh, does in fact exist. So it's a nice uh, prediction of the model. Although I don't know how many people in the hippocampus world actually um, use this model or cite it, but I, I actually like it a lot. I think it's very simple to understand and a pretty elegant use of these. Uh, yeah. And it can be implemented using various different frameworks. It doesn't have to be a Grossberg um, style model. So, so the basic idea we're going to look at is these last two points. Stripe cells allocated to different orientations of, of linear movement uh, will combine to create grid cells. So like I said, this is just like the basic calculus uh, we're applying to two different types of quantities, where X could be the angular displacement or, or angular acceleration or the li linear X's position, sorry, angular position or linear position. So that's what these systems do or come up with approximations of this. And uh, like I said, this is how accelerometers work. Here's, this is some sort of fancy accelerometer of like maybe for planes or rockets or something. But when you think about it, it like I often, thought, how would I go about making one, like an accelerometer? And the first thing that came to mind was a pendulum. Uh, uh, that would be pretty good for just the linear acceleration because like imagine that you suspend a pendulum from the top of a car. It will only be um, non-vertical when you're accelerating or decelerating. So you can use that and maybe some sort of like you make a Rube Goldberg machine to kind of measure the displacement in a set of discretized angles. And you can use that to accumulate uh, and then do another accumulator for, for position. Um, so that's how the linear accelerometer works. For the, for the um, angular accelerometer, you need something that basically uh, responds to torque. So it will uh, turn like, a, like a something suspended that, will, that has a moment, moment of inertia and, and will turn as a result of a turning force. That's what these systems do. And now you have them on tiny little chips, uh, which are sitting in the phones and stuff. The, the, the brain's solution is the vestibular accelerometer, uh, which is a really quite a, a beautiful system. And I'm sure there's more mis there plenty of mysteries to how it works that haven't fully been understood. But uh, I just came across this uh, short review paper about it. It's really, really good if you're curious. But uh, well, basically, there are all these little bones. I love the term otolith, ear bones, that um, uh, engage in different kinds of motion and are constrained, so that the the um, the, the the first ones down the linear sensors, the otolith organs, can only move in a linear way, and the the movement in the these semi these circular the the canals uh, does the the angular uh, acceleration in three different directions. So. With the combination of all these things, basically they, they push on hair cells in different ways and those hair cells excite um, uh, neurons. So their displacement uh, is, is a, pr produced by force acting on them, either force or torque. So that's the vestibular accelerometer. So before we get into how to sort of put all this together, there's a nice, um, a simple geometric logic that, um, uh, Himanshu came up with, which is just like the level zero using trigonometry to understand why grid cells might form. Uh, so the key question with grid cells is, why is it 60 degrees? Why not some other um, uh, a set of angles? So you can now, since we've just, just talked about the need for stripe cells, let's assume for now that we've got stripe cells. We've done that. Um, we've discretized to a set of possible directions you can be traveling in in a linear um, displacement um, with respect to a landmark. We picked a landmark and now we have a bunch of stripe cells. Let's pick one of those stripe cells and let's call it um, the first one, the horizontal one, and say that, the, and that has a particular spacing, L. Uh, we, once we pick that, we call that the zero angle. And we can ask, given some other um, stripe cell that's 
that who has a different preferred direction. So it's keeping track of linear motion in a different direction. We'll just call it theta. We can we can look and see that there, there will be coincidences in the firing if uh, of at their peak response. So you can ask when will the uh, coincidences happen between them. So um, if we specify how the firing of the second stripe cell d theta um, projects onto the space of the spiraling of, of the first one. Uh, you can come up with a very simple trig um, trigonometric rule for when coactivations will happen, given uh, a common spacing. Um, so when they, they so they both have to be uh, integer multiples uh, of the lattice length. So you get this rule cos theta is equal to n over m, where n is the spacing of one of them, the number of times after which a coincidence happened for each of them. So basically in this case, this was like, five, what is it? Five versus four. Yeah, five and four, yeah. And so as those numbers increase, like the number of, of cycles you need to wait before a coincidence happens, like a perfect coincidence, the, um, there's fewer and fewer opportunities for co-activation. Um, so the larger that distance, the less frequent the co-activations are. So you can ask the opposite question, what's the simplest non-trivial um, set of n and m you can get. You just plug in n and m is one and two. If both are one, then they're both, because cos one is zero, so they're both the same. So any, the only non-trivial answer is, um, is when cos theta is half. And there you go, <laughs> there you have your 60 degrees. So the geometric answer is that 60 degrees maximizes co-activations of, of stripe cells that, um, are oriented in different uh, angles. So if, if cells wanted to be coactive most often, this, will, this would be the angle they'd pick. So now the question is, how can you get the system to do that? Um, there's also a big assumption here, which I basically, which is that we're talking about stripe cells with the same spacing. If they are a bunch of different spacings, then all this kind of has to get thrown out the window. And you'll have to do the same calculation for every set of spacings. So they have some argument for how to make sure that stripe cells and grid cells of the same spatial scale learn. They've actually sorted that out in the in the dissertation, uh, but I won't get into that. There's, but this, it involves habitude, habitude of gating actually. But we talked about that a couple of times. But if we, anyone's curious, we can talk about it at the end. Um, but th this relaxing this assumption may actually help accounting for distortions to the shape of the grid in unusually shaped build or small um, enclosures. So I remember once going to SFN and seeing this, and now it's getting well verified finding that in small or unusually shaped, um, where the walls are sort of weird angles, uh, or near the walls, you get distortions in the, the neat grid cell spacing. So it's not a perfect hexagon anymore. And so keeping this in mind, um, it, you may find that that uh, there's, there's some assumption here that doesn't always hold near these in these boundary kind of cases. So um, it kind of brings up a what I think is uh, I find so counterintuitive about a lot of this, which is that a lot of it's sort of dependent on the shape of the enclosure and and the very fact that an animal's been stuck in a little circular kind of environment or a little tea maze or something. And every time I try to kind of daydream about what this would be like for me, I'm like, all right, I'm sitting in a room right now and I'm facing in a particular direction, but I know that my room, my office is in a part of the second floor of my house and below me is something that I couldn't really get to right now, but I can think about the kitchen and there's food in there, but I know to get to the kitchen, I've got to go in this elaborate kind of walk down the stairs and, you know, down the corridor or whatever. Um, and so I, and then I'm like, well, how the hell does the grid mapping of my house work in two dimensions, even though, and parts of those dimensions aren't even linearly accessible by a, a straight movement in X, Y, but have to go, and it just, it just starts hurting too much. And I stop I, like, you know what? I can't handle this anymore. Um, yeah. But I feel like this is the, the whole, that's the rub, right? Is that what we do mentally in our, um, in, a, in sort of navigating abstract spaces is much more like me going down the stairs and around the corridor to get to the kitchen to get food than it is me going through the floor to get food. Anyway, I, I find this stuff all very, very hard to wrap my it's head It's very hard to, 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 to think about, but I think that 
there's there's some interesting sort of geometric and statistical consideration. So when I I suggested to someone, and I think they've started doing it, um, looking at three D uh, grid grid cells, if any, because three D place cells seem to seem to exist, or at least in the, with visual input. So it's a little bit complicated because it may not be based on vestibular input. But in primates, you can look at this, and um, I think they found that there wasn't any sort of hexagonal close packing, which would be, which would be the uh, an analogous representation in 3D. And mm. one possibility is that even in primates, the, the main use of this would be walking around in the dark uh, in a 2D room. And then you kind of have to reset um, or, or uh, when you get to a different floor. So you're using this, um, this maybe older kind of me uh, me mechanism in certain situations. And um, one thing that, I, um, Himachi found was that the, the training pattern actually ma matters a lot. It, it needs to be pretty exhaustive. Um, so he tried make, using random walks and things like that, and it didn't actually work. So he actually used the trajectories derived from the original data in order to get it to work. So there's some kind of re somewhat exhaustive sampling that is important. And when we get into 3D, I suspect that just for just because of the nature of the transition from 2D to 3D, the possibility of exhaustive sampling of trajectories becomes very slim. So mm. the same self-organizing map, which we'll look at, that, that works pretty neatly when you can exhaustively cover a space, but probably won't work uh, when you're not kind of neatly covering the whole space. Um, that's speculative, but I can imagine why, that, why, why you would get yeah. some sort of really, really weak um, grid-like pattern. Um, uh, if if your trajectories are are not uh, particularly exhaustive, so for instance, when you're new, when it, for a human being, which we uh, we have like we can't really do dead reckoning in a city, right? <laughs> we actually are using visual cues and things like that. So where we are able to do dead reckoning is not that different. Maybe the rats probably better than us um, at yeah. that. But where we are, but humans can do. It's like in your bedroom or something with the lights off, you can move around um, just fine, and you know where everything is. I mean, I did actually say this, but that's one of the ideas for why this is useful, um, this, this system, because you can do navigation with, um, with visual patterns. Um, but one idea is that the visual patterns are pretty high dimensional, whereas this um, vestibular signal is pretty low dimensional. So you, you calibrating the one with the other. So you use the rich information to kind of create anchors and then use the low dimensional signals to, uh, to then create something really stable. Um, that seems to be the best of both worlds. But in situations like me navigating in the whole town, it's clear that I've not taken all the roads <laughs> that, that one could take. Uh, and because of walls and roads and sidewalks and things, I'm highly constrained in what those paths are. So even in a like a really, really flat town, I would not expect to see grid cells on the scale of the town. Uh, at least I, that's just a, a hypothesis, but I, I'd be very, very surprised if humans had grid cells on the scale of of like several blocks. It's, it's tough experiments to do well, for sure. But I think there are experiments with, with rodents that, you know, claim that, you know, grid cells go out to like mile, like very long distances. So, but I mean, a, a lot of this, a lot of this is still done in a small lab where it's just like simulated long distances or something. Um, Actually, yeah, that's an important point. So there are studies that that claim that that the grid form the grid cell. You need a relatively, yeah. yeah, maybe all you need is to relatively to have an exhaustive exploration in a certain zone, and then you you kind of extrapolate from there. Because once you've anchored to the visual uh, cue, as long as that visual cue is still there, maybe it still works. I have to think about that. Uh, <laughs> because there's a there's a degree of extrapolation you can do once the grid cell pattern has been established. Maybe that kicks in, but maybe like when you're actually tr uh, transitioning from one room to another or when the tree or whatever is gone, then that gets reset. Uh, that would be, so in a, like a, so yeah, oh, that would be awesome, right? Like put a rat in a desert, or like something where there's only one queue and see, and, and like with a neural link remote control, uh, 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 recording from the CA uh, from uh, from internal and CA one, see if you could just get the same grid field to operate for like the whole uh, distance that the the rat travels. Doable yeah. by Elon Musk. 
But instead of assuming that the whole thing is all laid out and everything is running according to that, if you say that yeah, we only take one step at a time, it's a very small process. Yn plus one equals yn and plus yn minus one. That is all you need and you just keep building on it. So within right. my hands and legs distance, that is how far I can move. That really applies when you're walking in darkness, you can see your step size becomes really small. But if and you then know, if you know already, the room pretty well. Like no, if you know the room well very well, even then, if you look at the step size you make with your eyes open versus closed, you'll be making very small steps. And you're also kind of already anticipating, I'm going to get to this landmark, this landmark, that landmark. So the, I'm saying that the whole process is one step at a time. Right. But, but the point is that this is a testable hypothesis for how far the, I mean, we know the grid cell pattern exists, at least in rodents. And I think in, in primates too, actually. No, you so know where, the, what the are all is the how far the tiling goes. No, you know where the landmarks are, but I am not convinced you know the absolute distance. That but I'm talking about the, the, the neurons, not the organism. Yeah, right? no, but, we, we yeah, already but know that so the, the neuron is. is really a mapping. It is only a marker to say, I, here is, this is where I expect to find the next landmark. But, but the grid cell doesn't work based on land, landmarks alone. That's the whole point, right? right. The, the yeah. vestibular system is not a, a landmark system because it's pro providing these, these signals that get integrated. So it's aligned to a landmarks, but it, it right. works without landmarks. The, the reason it has that yeah. the pattern that it does is because it is, is um, uh, integrating from these, you know, that, That's what I was getting at. Yeah. One step can be code, coded with a are orchestrated with the vestibular system, but multiple steps could be just with landmarks that are brought in as and when you get closer. Well, maybe, but there's within a lot of your, within your reckoning body is a real space. thing. Like, right. like yeah. dead reckoning does happen. So, okay. so, so it, it, it's uh, possible in some situations too. But yeah, it will be fun to imagine <laughs> yeah. really big enclosure and see how far <laughs> the thing goes. So, um, so yeah. So, 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 so that's the sort of geometric. Uh, Ask a question. The, this idea that you've said several times that that uh, like a justification for this would be um, navigating in the dark, and that your example keeps coming up. And it it seems to me that you would there would be a huge advantage just to having an idea of where things are, like behind your back, like outside of your visual field, right? You don't need to be in the darkness necessarily, right? I, I think that would be more a compelling reason as to why you would want grid cells, right? Because they're, they're useful all the time. Well, the, the grid cells are not directly necessarily being associated with objects. I think the general idea is that um, the place cells are doing that. But like you said, you might you'll need place cells for the dark too. But since rodents are nocturnal, um, it's all the same in all directions. But yeah, if you could, uh, like once you've set up a system, uh, it, it you kind of want it to be somewhat amodal, uh, and 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 so that you can like. Uh, navigate towards things or, or make plans based on things that aren't in your visual field. But 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 you could still argue that the way that that map was populated was by looking around, you know, so it's, um, so because once you turn away, the visually primed map can still exist uh, in, in some uh, non-egocentric coordinates. And that, that I mean, and it, and it does exist, meaning that we have plenty of evidence that those types of uh, maps uh, are formed. So, so it's more like the type of input that goes in gives you some clues about the kind of um, behaviors that, or the kind of constraints on behavior that, where you you know don't have the visual signal but still want to move, um, might have been why it evolved in the first place. And then Paul Shisek's paper, he talks about this period when the prime, the ancestors of 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 I think all mammals, which is primates, they were initially they were nocturnal and then became diurnal and and so to like if the good cells work just fine in on all of all of the these, these animals then you could imagine that they they may, may have evolved or something like them evolved way back when when the common ancestor was a nocturnal creature and um quick kind of calibration using sounds smells and whatever little light there is uh would would be coupled to the slower process of gradually understanding in some restricted uh, environment where um, like what the map is basically.
yeah, it's a, I mean, it's an open kind of thing because we don't really um, have to know exactly how these things work or because you can disrupt any of these systems and the other systems will kick in to kind of compensate in most cases. Um, in fact, that review of the vestibulary, vestibular system talks about this, that many people who have problems with the vestibular system can actually function reasonably well. So there's a, you know, it's only in some circumstances that, that they can't. So, so it's also the case that there's a fair amount of redundancy across systems, which probably is also a good thing. Um, so in order to, to kind of put flesh on that geometric idea, we need uh, a mechanism for stripe cell creation and a way of combining uh, the stripe cells that seeks out those uh, maximal coactivations. So the answer I've already given for the first one is, is basically that integration uh, process with a reset. Um, and uh, so then the way you can do that, they, they kind of implement it directly uh, in this model, uh, like phenomenologically, if you like, that after a certain uh, spatial distance, the cells just go back down to zero in a smooth way. And uh, the second step involves a self-organizing map. So before we get there, uh, we could talk about how these uh, key kind of players in this system are modeled. So um, we haven't talked much about the attractor lingo in the, in the Grossport world, but he, he does use one here because it's kind of standard in the field to talk about ring attractors. So um, the standard way of making one uh, is, you know, the subplot A is a classic on center Ross around network, uh, but with a circular topology. Um, so when the information about the angular velocity is integrated into these cells, it will keep maintain a bump in a particular angle. And then when, these, when other cells that are tuned to other um, angular uh, velocities um, receive more input through the competition, the bump shifts. And this, this paper actually is looking at evidence that the shift is like what's happening in C, which is a pretty rapid shift. So, so the, you can actually see like one bump kind of go down and the other one come up rather than sort of gradually moving the, um, the bump from one side to the other. Um, so this structure is called a ring attractor. It's pretty much stand, the, the, the standard way to model is very easy to model. Um, and you also see it in the context of working memory for um, eye movements and Xiaojing Wang's bump attractor model and stuff like that. Um, where it sometimes it might take it sometimes a little conceptually quirky, but we need we are also going to use a ring attractor in this model for linear displacement, um, and that's how you get the reset basically. So, so we're no longer talking about orientation. We're talking about just phase with respect to this um, spacing of the stripe cell. So the stripe cell has a phase of some length, after which it resets. So this, this, you have a set of cells that span that length uh, and those, those cells form a ring attractor. Um, so you know, this blue one happens here and then here again and here again. And you'll need one for however many, however, however the, whatever the granularity is of how you've sort of tiled the space of possible linear trajectories. So for each of these trajectories, you could be traveling with respect to that um, uh, visually uh, rooted anchor You'll, you'll have a stripe cell and, and uh, the way that the, and you'll have a ring attractor for, e for each of those, the, the, those directions. So you'll have a set of stripe cells for each direction. So the question to ask is why a ring attractor? And this I kind of already said, because the ring attractor is what gives you resets. And just to reiterate, the, the reason you need a reset is because you don't have infinite sort of neural real estate to keep track of, you know, centimeters all the way up to kilometers. Um, so you need to say, okay, I'm gonna just, you know, in a sort of strategically forget and then start again. Uh, that's uh, in the spatial domain. And then uh, here's another question which maybe people don't ask as, that often is why should it be an attractor at all? Um, because we know that attractors have some stability properties, right? Why do we need those? Can't we just sort of do all this online? And again, straightforward answer. Um, we don't want to lose track of how far we've traveled when we stop moving. So this is a really nice, simple, low level reason for attractors uh, that when you're integrating some inf information, you want that information available, you know, not just while the integration is happening. Um, so you've got to hold on to it when that signal goes away. 
um, this is another way of thinking about things getting loaded into working memory and staying there. Uh, right. So this is uh, how this basically reiterating this point about um, why striped cells, how striped cells. Um, so they're predicted to occur in layer three of entrenal cortex. I didn't check whether that was where the striped cells or band cells were eventually found, but, but now there's some data on this. Um, so the displacement along a direction that is coded by a striped cell is a measure of the relative distance covered by navigating NO along that direction. Since the integration of velocity cannot continue indefinitely due to limited resources, at some point it has to reset back to zero and start again. So that's why we have that periodicity. And um, the same basic trigonometric argument is that when you have 60 degree uh, dis um, angular displacements among striped cells, then their maximal co-firings will occur in a hexagonal pattern. So the question is, why are the striped cells only combining uh, why are striped cells that are 60 degrees apart the ones that combine? Let's assume that you have all of them. If you were to combine all the striped cells with equal weight, you would get a kind of bullseye pattern, like nothing like a, um, a grid pattern. So this is why we need this, this additional mechanism, uh, which when <laughs> people have tried to use interference to, to, get, to model this stuff, and sometimes they just start with the 60 degree disc discrepancy among the... Um, equivalent of striped cells. And that doesn't really answer the question of where the 60 degrees came from. Um, maybe they have some uh, answer that lately, but in the early forms of the interference model didn't really answer that question. So the self-organizing map comes in and there's a little history here. Um, I really like the, the demonstration on, in, on Wikipedia, this GIF. GIF. Um, so the, the learning rule of a, of, of a, of a Cajonan style self-organizing map, uh, it's, a, it's a form that, that you see over and over and over again in neuroscience and machine learning, where basically the weight is learning some position or some data vectors values. And there's a, a representation of proximity that's controlling the learning. So what this theta function does is prevent all your learning vectors from converging on the mean of the of all the data. Like if I had only one vector that could learn all this data, it would end up somewhere here. If there was only one of these nodes, it would just sort of you know, split the difference, you know, be the mean of all the data. So uh, how, to, how you prevent that is with kind of the, the way in which learning restricts itself to some subregion of the, of the data space. And, it's a, and each, each of these nodes decides, well, I'm not gonna care about that stuff far away. And this can happen in various ways, but you basically need some sort of competition. It can be implemented in the weight learning or you know, with Steve's um, more um, excitation and inhibition-based competitions. So um, it's these self-organizing maps are usually at attributed to, to Cohonen, um, but the idea goes back to von der Marlsberg and, and Grossberg always says he invented it, but his first paper on it was from 76. But I think there's some whole story here about an earlier paper or something that wasn't published. Uh, but I, it does seem like that 64 or document has the basic idea too. But I think it's simple enough that other pe people might have invented it for themselves without necessarily stealing it. <laughs> um, so here's the, the version of it in um, uh, Himanshu's model, uh, the Matre model. Uh, after a while, you start to kind of see that all learning laws are sort of a variation on theme. Here, the one, one thing that's interesting, you can't necessarily see it from the equation, is that there's a weight normalization. So that the synaptic weights cannot all just increase in an unbounded way. They're kind of all competing for a limited resource. Which is a very useful um, way of basically reallocating priority within a neuron uh, and, not, and preventing kind of unbounded increases in, in um, synaptic uh, strength. But basically, you have a cell that is most active, um, represented by V, and that gets to learn uh, the, to, to, to respond maximally to the striped cells that are being input to. And that's how the, um, so, so this kind of automatically, as the animal is exploring, co-activations um, will strengthen so that at the end of, uh, of, of the learning, the good cell pattern stabilizes. <laughs> 
So competition and this type of uh, um, restricted weight learning, uh, both kind of combined. Habituative gates also help. They weren't essential for the early version of the model. But one thing I have mentioned is that the grid cells ha happen at different spatial scales. And you can actually use habituative gating um, to ensure that you get the spatial scales rather than separating the scales. So like say that the 10 centimeter stripe cells have nothing, have no connection to the 20 centimeter uh, stripe cells and so on. So you can actually um, assume a, a continuum of habituative uh, gates on the grid cells, on the, on the putative grid, grid cells that will actually give you a set of different scales of uh, of grid cells. And also this, the same self-organizing map learning with competition gives you the tiling, meaning that you get different grid cells for different phases by virtue of the fact that once a cell is committed to one phase, um, it is no longer interested in learning the from the stripe cells that are dis displaced um, in phase. So, so all this allows uh, phase offsets between uh, grids with the same spacing. This is actually simulation results. They're just using the same cross-correlation, autocorrelation analysis. So it looks just like data. Um, and um, NPL uh, did analysis uh, to show explicitly that uh, you get this phase tiling uh, kind of thing. Uh, and what we're talking about is, so yeah, so this competition here, um, there's active competition in, in the form of the actual on center off surround, as well as um, a sort of conserved weight on each each neuron. This is what um, gets you this um, phase tiling so that once a cell is, is dedicated to a particular phase, it no longer is learning weights from a displaced phase. Um, and uh, Pili and Grossberg also kind of linked up the, the, the Lego pieces into a bigger um, a simulation set. So you sh they showed that once you start with, with good cells uh, through learning, and this learning is again, kind of the same thing, but even simpler because you can do it with like a reward-based approach. Uh, eventually you get stable uh, place cells, which in this particular field are unique instead of um, periodic. So, um, so that, that's basically how that model works. And I guess there are a couple of interesting points uh, that aren't quite covered but, or like food for thought in this topic. Um, the good cells, as we talked about this actually, since they're anchored, they're anchored to visual input, but they remain stable in the dark. And what's nice is the original good cell paper did this. Um, they, they looked at spike activity in total darkness and found that the grid was maintained. So it's kind of cool that they thought to do that. Uh, um, that was nice. Um, and again, we talked about this. Why use vestibular signals? Why not just rely on visual signals? And I think the answer is A, you know, nocturnal animals need this. Um, and B, vestibular system uh, signals are relatively low dimensional. And uh, so, and because they're low dimensional, it may be easier to stabilize them. So, so it's not that we don't use visual signals um, in, in, during daylight when we're navigating, but each kind of helps to stabilize the other because, because the visual system is anchoring the, the, the good cell system. And so they kind of interact bidirectionally. Um, but interestingly, I came across this, I couldn't find the paper, but I remember coming across something, it might've been an SFN, but the, that in some cases you can see place fields in, in CA1 before the grid cells have stabilized. So um, if the place fields are doing this, um, then clearly they're forming without the good cells as their source of input. So one question, sort of open question is how does that happen? Uh, I remember bringing this up with, with uh, Himanchu and, and he had a good answer, but would anyone like to guess? <laughs> uh, this is an interesting kind of uh, thought. Uh, which relates to the stabilization issue. But uh, well, basically his, his suggestion was maybe that uh, place cells can just use the very high dimensional uh, input um, initially to form a quick um, uh, representation. And then later on, that is um, sort of takes on the input from the grid cell. So it kind of starts with something that could be very high dimensional. And we know that like, place cells can form 
with one shot learning. So, so you can either give a reward or even stimulate and cause a calcium burst in CA1 cells uh, and cause it to be selective to a particular point in, in uh, a space. So it could be that multiple types of information are all being uh, arriving at the place cells uh, and that the sort of fast information and the slow information can cooperate. I guess that remains to be explored. But yeah, that's that's that. That's the, um, the grids map model. Uh, and uh, any questions, comments? Clarifications. Cool. So I think with that, um, we've come to the end of the Grossberg book. And um, I uh, thanks to everyone for joining. I think it's been uh, quite uh, good fun to go through all this in detail. Uh, it's always Grossberg's work always points to other things in a very interesting way. So even if you don't buy it. There's always other things that you can learn from from this this kind of treatment. Uh, I'll stop the recording now and we can chat about the future sessions. I thought Hamanchu might join for this. Okay.